Does the time start now? Yes. <laughs> All right, so in three minutes, I hope that I can summarize what we do and uh, pique your interest a little bit. So in my lab specifically, I study the symptom of dyspnea. So for those of you who are not familiar with that, it's another more technical term for breathlessness or shortness of breath. And really the technical definition is that it's a subjective experience of breathing discomfort that people commonly will experience during physical activities such as exercise. So we're all common or we're all familiar with this type of sensation. What's important is that this symptom is actually a common and very debilitating symptom in patients with chronic heart or lung disease and particularly in the context of exercise. So you have individuals who have smoked for a long period of time, they developed emphysema or bronchitis and they become extremely uncomfortable, it limits their activities of daily living and really leads to an impoverished health related quality of life. So here I have a gentleman with COPD um, and on the right side there you see reasons for stopping exercise. So we bring a large number of individuals into the laboratory, we, push, we put them on a bicycle, we ask them to exercise as long and as hard as they can and when they're completely at their point of exhaustion, we say why did you stop exercise? Your breathing discomfort, your leg discomfort, a combination of the two or something else. And you can see that as many as 63% of these people complain of shortness of breath as the primary reason for them stopping exercise. So that anchors it from a clinical perspective that this is a very important symptom to understand so that we can effectively manage it and treat it. So a brief neurophysiology of this symptom. In the most basic sense, breathlessness really reflects the relationship of the drive to breathe and how well our respiratory system is able to accommodate this drive. So when healthy individuals, like presumably everybody in the room, you start exercising on a bicycle in the laboratory, we have increases in the drive to breathe and an appropriate response to the respiratory system in terms of how much volume we breathe, how quickly we breathe, and so on and so forth. And under these conditions, we get a normal awareness of an increase of our breathing. It may or may not be inherently uncomfortable, but we definitely notice our breathing. However, you take an individual who, say, has developed through bad habits, emphysema or bronchitis, and what happens is that they have a very accelerated drive to breathe. So there's a lot of drive going from the brain to the respiratory muscles, but because of the sickness of their lungs and their airways, they can't essentially do the work that's necessary to match it. And under these circumstances, people become incredibly symptomatic and incredibly short of breath, and they're limited in their exercise at levels of intensity that we take for granted walking upstairs. So in our lab, we use exercise on a bicycle as a stress. We measure um, the, the physiological responses using a metabolic cart, as you see there in the second white picture. We're unique in that we have about a meter long catheter that we push through the nose down into the stomach and the esophagus, which measures how well the respiratory system is actually responding to a stress. And there's one of my uh, undergraduate research students who's actually performing a technique, a procedure with a catheter actually pushed and it's down about 56, 55 centimeters into his body. When we record these measurements, we actually do recordings of the electrical activity of the diaphragm. So we, uh, I'll show you five channels here and the esophagus and the stomach and the, the pressure in the esophagus, the gastric pressure and how much air is moving into and out of the lungs. And so you can see that an individual at rest, you can see that the brain is really not sending all that much information on a per breath basis, a little bit of pressure being generated and a little bit of flow. But as we move into moderate and more strenuous exercise, you can see that the activation of the breathing muscle grows, the muscles begin to do more work, and particularly near strenuous exercise. So we can see how appropriate these responses are. Once we've quantified these things, we can relate our sensation to different physiological responses and compare these responses across individuals or across groups. So I know I'm over my time, but just to give you a sense of how we're applying these techniques, we're currently doing studies looking at patients with COPD. We're mimicking disease by push, essentially restricting the thorax using a chest wall strap. We're binding the abdomen with, uh, to essentially increase the pressures in there. We're doing studies related to obesity and we're comparing responses between healthy young men and women. Thank you.